Guten Abend. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Anbiya wa al-Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man istanna bi sunnatihi la yumidin Allahumma ja'alna minhum wa minal ladhina amanu wa amilu al-sabihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr amin ya Rabbil Alameen ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب وبشكل صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين uh, I don't know what you were laughing about before but I will find out <laughs> and I will give a khutbah about it you will see it on YouTube okay so <laughs> So, um, I actually only came here because of chocolate, uh, <laughs> but allegedly there was a lecture also, so I'm here. But Alhamdulillah, I was asked to speak with you tonight uh, briefly about the, uh, the fundamentals of faith, the foundations of faith, and I promise you that I will not make this a long lecture, I try not to, I would, I would rather, as I said in Switzerland when I was here, my primary motivation is to try to listen to you. Uh, so I want to actually make the question-answer portion of this longer. And it's not really even about your questions, it's more even about your concerns. And I'm, t I'm promising you from now, I may not be able to answer all of your questions, but I will certainly document them. My lectures and my talks are actually mostly based on what people ask me, and what concerns Muslim bring, Muslims bring to me. A lot of times Muslims study Islam, and of course, when you study Islam, then you are studying everything. You're studying a lot of things. So then how do you prioritize? How do you prioritize what to teach people? Learning is something else, teaching is something else. When it comes to teaching, in my personal view, we should teach what is actually of concern to the Muslims first. What people are actually confused about first. What they're asking about, what they're worried about, what they are, what is stressing them out, that should be a priority. Now, I cannot know that if I'm using the mic all the time, I, have, I can only understand that if I give you time to ask your concerns and ask your questions. So, even if your questions are not related to my topic, it's okay, even though I'm not welcoming that. But even if it's outside of the scope, it's okay. Even if I'm not able to answer it, it's okay. At least I know what's, what the concerns are. So, inshallah, in a future you know, attempt, I can try to address some of those issues. Now, today I was asked to speak about the foundations of faith. And what I want to share with you first and foremost is my own journey towards faith and how it's not, a, it's not unusual. The journey that I had towards Islam or back towards Islam is not unusual and many people have the same journey. But unfortunately when they talk about the faith itself, they use very artificial language. And I don't, I'm not interested in artificial language. I'm interested in, first of all, how the Qur'an describes the journey itself. There's actually a description in the Qur'an of the journey. There's a description of the journey. And this, there is not one journey. There are multiple journeys. Everybody has a different starting point. Even if their destination is the same, if you started somewhere else, your journey is going to be different from the person next to you. You understand? So the journey is important to understand. And then, of course, we get to the destination itself and we understand some things about the, the eventual. Now, as I speak to you, you must be hearing some babies going, <laughs> which is okay. Don't look at them with angry faces. Those mothers had a hard time coming here. They parked very far from here and they walked a long distance and they have a baby with them and their husband is relaxing on this side. <laughs> so, you know. so it's okay. The babies make a little bit of it's okay, no problem. Now if your baby is particularly psycho, <laughs> then maybe take a walk, you know, or something. But otherwise, it's once in a while, a little screamy here and there is no problem. And that's also, you know, because I, alhamdulillah, I have six children, and they make a lot of noise, so I don't hear anything anymore. Right? <laughs> I just talk, so. <laughs> now the ayah that I began with. Actually, this is something many of you have heard many, many, many times. And I want to... I want to begin with, I, like I said, my own journey. And when I, when I became, when I came to the United States, uh, I had my upbringing was mostly in the Muslim world, and I came into the United States when I was about 14, 15 years of age. And I went into public high school. And I, and in those two years of high school, I did not have any Muslim friends. 
and you don't get time off to go pray Jum'ah. And my father was working in the city anyway, so I couldn't go with anybody else anyway. So I did not pray any prayers for those two years. Maybe once in a while my dad would take me if the school was off, you know? So we would maybe go to the Jum'ah prayer. Now before this, I was in an Islamic environment where I was, you know, it was all boys school, all my teachers were Muslim. When the teacher walked in, you said, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You stood up and you said that. Then the teacher responded to you and you sat down. It was a different environment. But when I went to New York and I went to high school, it was not the same environment. Boys and girls were together. There, were, there was no new uniform. In some places there was no clothing. You know, there was, it, was, it was different, you know. And at first you're shocked and you're disturbed. How can they be like this? Astaghfirullah al you see all that, but you know what? After six months, it's not a stuff for Allah, it's mashallah. It's <laughs> Everything changes. You get used to it, you know? And then you start thinking that maybe the way I used to live was strange, and this is normal. That was strange, and this is normal. Because everybody else is one way, and I'm a different way, so I must be the one that's crazy. So you start, and human beings have a tendency, they want to fit with everyone else. We have a desire not to be different from everyone else. We want to be acceptable to other people. It's a desire that we have. We look for acceptance with our family. We look for acceptance with our friends. Even if you don't say it, you feel it. When you feel rejection, it hurts. So, you know, people start changing themselves. They, they change the way they look a little bit. They change the way they talk a little bit, you know? And if all of your friends use filthy language, then in order to fit in, guess what? You start using filthy language. If all of your friends make fun of other people, after a while, it's okay for you to make fun of other people. It just becomes part of who you are. And so that happened to me. And a point came where, by the time I was in college, I was around friends who made fun of God, who made fun of religion, who thought religion was a stupid thing. And guess what? I used to think the same thing. I thought the same thing. And I, I just adopted their arguments and what they told me as acceptable to myself. Now when you're in that state, if you saw me, if you were in, in Baruch College in New York City in 1998 when I went to college there, and you saw me walking around, you would not think I'm Muslim. You would not think I'm Muslim. And if you saw me talking to a Muslim, you would think that I'm some kind of Islam hater. That's what you would think, if you just got a first impression of me. And I've had all these, you know, philosophical arguments, you know, based, rooted in agnosticism, all the way spreading, all the way to atheism. And I had all this stuff, like, prepared for myself, if anybody even brought up religion, even Islam. But you know, you have to be honest with yourself. And I realized after a long time that I wasn't being honest with myself. And that is something you can, that conversation with yourself, you can only have when you are left alone from all the pressures. When all the pressures are removed and it's just you, by yourself, having a conversation with yourself. And I, deep down inside, I knew there's something wrong, but I didn't want to accept it. And if you don't want to have a conversation with yourself, what you do is you keep yourself busy around people, and when you're not around people, you turn the TV on, or you watch something online, or you play a video game, so your mind is always busy in something else. It never has time to just stop and think, just reflect. Just ponder. I'm not even saying thinking about God. I'm just saying thinking. Today the world has a crisis because a lot of people, if not the vast majority of people, from childhood are programmed not to think. They're programmed not to think. On the flight here from the, from the United States when I was flying to London, you know they have those Sky Mall magazines where they sell you stuff online on, in the air, right? So I'm going through it and I see the strangest ad. They have a potty chair for kids with an iPad stand. So if your kid, you know, in the middle of his business, he runs away, he put an iPod there, iPad there, and he can keep watching his shows and he can stay there for as long as you can give him the half the day, he'll be fine. And I said to myself, subhanAllah, we are now at a time where we are programming even young children to become so addicted to screens and to games and to videos and to this and to that where they're actually not engaging with the real world. I've actually literally seen kids that play, you know, games in their, on, their, on their iPads. They play like football and this and that and they move the, move the ball like this, right? So when they hold a real football, they go like this. <laughs> Nothing's happening. <laughs> 
out of love. But the first foundation of faith is independent thought. The first foundation of the Islamic faith is the ability to think clearly. Now this ayah says, no doubt about it in the skies, inna fi khalqi samawati wal ard, no doubt about it in the creation of the skies and the earth, waqtilaf al layli wal nahar, and in the, in the conflict between the night and the day, as night turns into day and day turns into night, la ayatin li ulil albab, there are miraculous signs, there are clear indications, there are powerful indications for people of sound minds. I'll translate that again at the end, sound powerful minds. The ulil al-bab. Now what Allah is saying here is the, the skies and the earth actually are according to Him and the night and the day are actually miracles. People say that if I would believe if I saw a miracle, I would, I'm ready to accept the faith. If you show me something amazing, like if you just like go like that and a tree comes out of here, then I will, I'm ready. I'm Muslim. I'm done. You know? They want to see a miracle. And Allah uses the word ayah not only for things like the staff of Musa turning into a snake. He doesn't just use the, the word miracle for the shape of a bird by Isa, by Jesus, turning into a living bird. He doesn't just use it for that. He uses it for the sky and the earth. And he uses it for the night and the day. And so he's demanding from us to think, if you really truly think about it, the sky is pretty incredible. The earth is remarkable. Night is incredible. Day is remarkable. It's something that will make you wonder. But who is going to wonder if their entire night and their entire day is spent not thinking? Just not thinking. Has it ever happened to you that you're stuck in traffic? You're probably, you're you're probably stuck in traffic a lot. So if you're stuck in traffic and it's at evening time and the sun is setting and your car hasn't moved for the last 10 minutes, so you actually you don't have anything else to do, so you just start looking at the orange sky. And for a few seconds, you're just amazed by the beauty of this painting, which is real. You're just lost in it. You're just mesmerized by it. Those few moments is what Allah is talking about. Now, if in the creation of the skies and the earth, and the conflict of the night and day, there are powerful signs, it's not for everyone. For a believer, Allah is saying, for a Muslim, for a, or not even a Muslim actually, Ulul al-Bab is more than Muslim. Liqawm and Ya'aqilun is more than Muslim. Anybody who exercises their intellect. Allah is saying, if you were to pay attention to these things, you would be left in wonder. But He doesn't, he doesn't open this for everybody. He says, Li'ulil al-Bab. So we have to identify and qualify this term. What does it mean to be people of, and I'll give you without translation the word, the people of Lubb. L-U-B-B, -B, if you want to write it down. Okay, Lubb, Nam and Ba. What does this word mean? They say, Al-Lubb wa aqlul salih, khalisun min al they say that this lub is actually a pure mind. I know very good. Okay. Uh, see? Okay. Khalisun min al It means a sound mind that is free from vanities. I know that sounds like difficult English, so I have to explain this to you, inshallah, in as easy language as I can. We nowadays get bombarded with information, yes or no? Where we have too much information about too many things. Uh, you go and buy yourself some chocolate milk. By the way, you have heavenly chocolate chocolate milk in this country. I am. I, ha I had a like higher iman when I drink the chocolate. Milk. <laughs> yes. You want me to hold that? Oh, oh, you guys haven't heard me all this time. Wow. And you just sat there, huh? <laughs> just sat there. No protest, no nothing. Okay. Okay. All right. Fine. Fine. So, I was talking about, I was, this was a lecture about chocolate milk. No, no. So, now what I'm saying is we are bombarded with information. So I refer to chocolate milk because if you turn to the side of the chocolate milk, what do you get? Like 45 ingredients? This percent of this, this percent of that. There's a lot of information, isn't it? You, you're, you're, every commercial, every advertisement you read is information. You know, every movie you watch is a lot of information. Actually, video games are more and more information now. Especially if you play role-playing games, there are so many rules and weapons and sub-weapons and upgrades and updates and trophies. There's a lot of information to keep up with. And of course, cheat codes and walkthroughs. It's a lot of work. 
It's like a full semester in college. You know, it's serious work. If you ever see kids play a video game, like I remember, even this is really long, many years ago, one of my roommates used to play Final Fantasy, all the Final Fantasy video games. And I sat there and I watched him play it one time. And he's going through menu, sub-menu, item, sub-item, weapon, this, and it's all in Japanese. <laughs> and he's still doing it. Whoa! So I asked him, when do you play this? Because <laughs> you're still in the menus for the last half hour. <laughs> But that was the game. The game is mostly the menus, you know? <laughs> so there's a lot of information. Then some of you are sports fans, right? Like we are, we're big sports fanatics in, in America, except for, of course, football. Your football. Right? So the, but, you know, you know, American football, basketball over here, probably, you know, football. You know all these teams. You know the athletes' names. You know the contracts. You know how much they get paid. You know which team has corruption charges. You know, all this stuff. You know, all this stuff. There's so much information. Now, information, according to the, in the Arabic language, information that has no benefit. That actually, at the end of the day, does not make you a better human being. It is only information for the sake of information. It's fluff. It doesn't really amount to anything. That kind of information is vain. It's useless. And a person of lug is, actually has a mind that is free from useless information. The more useless information you take in, the less you are capable of processing good information. Now how does that work? If you eat a lot of bad food, if you eat a lot of junk food, and then you also eat an apple, does that undo all the damage? No. If you want to get healthier, you don't just eat healthy food. What do you have to do? You can tell, you can call it out, it's okay. What do you have to do? Stop eating. Stop you eating. have to stop the junk food. And at the same time eat the healthy food. You have to do two things. If somebody is, uh, you know, diabetes, and they say, well, I'm eating a lot of other food now. I haven't cut down on the sugar, but I also added some carrots to my diet. Or, <laughs> you know, I drink a lot more water now. It doesn't help. You have to cut down on the junk. Now, the same way, if, if, you're, if you and I are going to become people of love, people of clear thought, then we have to start detoxing, eliminating the obsession with useless information. It has to become less. We may not be able to eliminate it altogether because we are in the over-information age, right? So you don't, may not be able to eliminate it altogether, but you have to try to cut it down as much as you possibly can. Now think about this. What do you, what do you put up on WhatsApp? What do you update on Facebook? What do you tweet? The things you send out, are they mostly useful or useless information? Is it a cat playing a piano? <laughs> you know, is it a guy who got his leg bit off by a shark and he just, you know, beat it out or whatever? This is awesome. You know? Is it that kind of, and isn't that the most popular kind of information? Like if you look at YouTube videos, the most popular videos are the most useless also. Like, I mean, look at it, it they're entertainment. They're entertaining, but they're also the most useless. So the world is migrating towards popularizing the most useless kinds of information. And are there, for example, are there educational videos on YouTube? Sure. You can learn to do a lot of things on YouTube, right? You can learn to paint your house. You can learn to knit a sweater. You can learn all kinds of things. How many hits do those things get? Now compare that to cats playing, playing piano. There's no competition. Human beings tend to migrate in mass towards useless information. Now Allah is saying to us that you are not going to be able to appreciate the sky and the earth as miraculous until you become people that can get away from what? Useless information. Then when you receive beneficial information, it will actually impact you. It won't be a lot of junk mixed with some good food and it's still overall, it's still junk. So here you are, some of you here, you listen to Islamic lectures, or you try to read something about the Qur'an, or you're trying to learn about your religion, and you're trying to understand more and more, but at the same time, you are also obsessed with entertainment. You're also just, you're addicted. You're addicted to this stuff. And so you ask yourself, I listen to all these talks. I listen to all this stuff. How come I don't change? How come I don't become a better person? I listen to it, but it doesn't impact me. Well, maybe it doesn't impact you because there's still too much junk going in. You know? 
They say in Arabic, the container only gives out what it contains. If you take in a lot of junk, what will come out of you in your speech, in your behavior, in your time is going to be useless. If you take in good things, then what comes out of you is also good things. So the way you spend your time is a manifestation of what you allow yourself to be exposed to more and more and more. And that's the wonderful thing about today's times. We have choices. I have the choice to go online and watch something beneficial or watch something harmful. I have that choice. It is not even like 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's not like 100 years ago where everybody got the same newspaper. It's not like where everybody had to watch the same channels. There was nothing else. Now we have choice. So now we, we are even more personally responsible. We can't even say, well, there's nothing good ever on. Well, actually, there's plenty on. It's just a matter of accessing it, isn't it? So Allah has done that for us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, that was the first point I wanted to make. I know, that was hard. Hey, whose baby's on the floor? <laughs> Head of the stairs? Seriously? Okay. It's okay. It happens. I forget babies all the time. So anyway, now the, now the difficult part. Some people believe that you will come to Islam if I give you proof. If I argue and debate with you and prove to you that God exists. Then I will prove to you that the Qur'an is a miracle. Then I will prove to you that Muhammad Sallallahu is not a liar, etc, etc. And after this debate, you will become a Muslim. Uh, no. That's not how it works. If you know anything about debates, you know what they are, right? They are two people with big egos. They're two people with big egos. And one is trying to disprove the other, and one is trying to disprove the other. And when you are in a debate, and if you're losing, when you're losing a debate, do you feel like accepting your opponent's arguments? No, you actually feel more hatred towards your opponent. And so you develop even more aggression towards what they're saying. So even if you lose, you don't say you win. You say, I'll be back with new, new arguments tomorrow. You understand? So winning a debate is not da'wah. It's not calling anybody to Islam. Nor is it the way of the Prophet wasallam. nor is it the way of the Qur'an, actually. The Qur'an's fundamental call is to allow people to think on their own terms independently. But before that even, Allah Azza wa mentions in this ayah something very powerful. And something that some of you might disagree with. Some people that are maybe, there are non-Muslims in the audience, I'm sure. People that don't belong to this faith, I'm sure they're in the audience. And I'm glad that you're here so I can explain this to all of you, you know, Muslims and non-Muslims here, inshallah. He says the people of sound thinking, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ That's part one. وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ is part two. There are two parts. Allah describes the people of good minds with two parts. Part one, they remember God. They remember God and they mention Him. Standing, sitting, and on their sides. That's part one. I'll test you on this soon. What was part one? Remembering God. They remember God. Number two, they think about the skies and the earth. They think about the skies and the earth. So the ayat began with the skies and the earth. But then they switched and they said, these people remember Allah. Now the thing is, dhikr. It's called dhikr in Arabic. Remembering Allah. Where does that happen according to the Quran? أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنَّا الْقُلُوبِ by remembering Allah, hearts become satisfied. Remembering Allah is an exercise of the heart. So in modern language you can say, remembering Allah is a spiritual exercise. Understandable? Remembering Allah is a spiritual exercise. Now part two, he says, they think about the skies and the earth deeply. They think deeply, they ponder, they reflect. They develop ideas about the skies and the earth. Now thinking, pondering, analyzing. Is that a spiritual exercise? No, what is that? That's an intellectual exercise, isn't it? So Allah is saying in these ayat that if you are going to be people that discover the truth, develop your faith, then you have to, have, you have to be people that are engaged spiritually and engaged intellectually. There has to be two sides of this. Any one side of this and you will not get it. You will not get it. There are religions in the world that say that their faith is spiritual. And if you ask intellectual questions, they say no. 
Don't ask those questions. They'll, you know, save your heart, save your soul. Don't ask intellectual questions. There are other philosophies in the world that are entirely intellectual. And if you bring up anything about the spiritual dimension of the human being, then they say that doesn't exist, you can't scientifically prove it, there is no spirituality, there is no such thing as, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, love, it's just some neurons firing in our brain, it's not, there's no such emotion like love or feeling closeness to God or, you know, these feelings don't really exist, the spiritual dimension doesn't exist. What the Qur'an is saying is, people of sound minds recognize that they were given something spiritual inside them. You don't have to prove it. You don't have to prove the sun is there. It's there. It's obvious. If something inside you is there that is spiritual in nature, it's the ruh Allah gave you. There's something Allah put inside you that gives you the ability to love others. It gives you the ability to, to love truth. You like truth and you don't like lies. You like justice and you don't like injustice. You, you appreciate love and respect and courtesy and you don't appreciate disrespect and injustice and harshness. There's something inside us that inclines towards some things and turns away from some other things. That is something Allah put inside of us. You love beauty and you hate ugliness. You love cleanliness and you hate dirty things. You're, you're inclined away from them. That is something Allah put inside of us. That's a spiritual side of us. Now Allah is saying you have to be people who can remember Allah in all times. يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ Which is uh, the reason I picked this as my basis for the fundamentals of faith. Many of you are university students. Show of hands, university students. Okay, good. A good majority of you are. Okay. It's hard to, hard to be spiritual on campus. It's very hard. Is it easy? It's super easy, huh? Well, you're, at least one person has it easy. The rest of us, including myself, have a hard time spirituality on campus. You know, there's fitna around you, there's, there's challenges, there, you're always busy with work. How are you supposed to make time for Allah? Actually, the first act of getting closer to Allah is simply remembering Him. Simply remembering Him. Remembering Him as you're walking from one class to another class. Remembering Him right before you're having lunch. Remembering Him when you look out your window. Just remembering Him, that's all. He's not asking for more. He's just saying, just remember. And when you get a free moment, then what do you have to do? And they think deeply about the skies and the earth. This is actually one of the great beauties of Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in the Fatiha, He told us that we want to walk on the straight path. Then He mentioned people on one side of the path and the other side of the path. He said, Laid al maghdubi alayhim and there are two sides, two extremes. Now if you notice, the people that came before us, one nation before us, emphasized spirituality. Our Christian brothers they, and sisters, they emphasized spirituality. And our Jewish brothers and sisters, what did they emphasize? The intellect. Allah describes that they became entirely intellectual and their hearts became hard. That's the criticism Allah makes of them. And Allah says you have to walk the path in the middle. What does that mean? You have to emphasize the spiritual and you have to emphasize the Intellectual, you have to find a balance between those two things, which is very, very difficult. Some of you want to learn about Islam and you read a lot of books. You listen to a lot of lectures, which is all academic, it's intellectual. And you're not growing spiritually, and it's not healthy. And some of you say, I just want the spiritual, I just want to pray, I just want to make dua, I don't want to learn anything. Learning is useless, I just want to pray, pray, pray. That's also unhealthy. You have to learn. Learning is part of this religion. You have to combine both of those things. You cannot let one overtake the other. It is thought and learning on the one hand, and is remembering God on the other hand. Those of you that are active in your Muslim students' associations, the activists here, the people that are regular in doing da'wah work and all this other stuff, you are the people that learn more than other people, which means you should pray more than other people too. You have to balance that equation. You know, if I'm teaching more, I should be turning to Allah more. Because if I don't, I'll become imbalanced. This, this people of love, these are people that are balanced. They're balanced. You know what you find nowadays? You find people that look very religious. On the outside, with their clothing, with their face, with their appearance, they look very, very religious. But in their personal lives, they have deep spiritual problems. They have deep, deep spiritual problems. When they pray, they're not connected to Allah. They just finish and go. They're very quick to tell people they're not making wudu properly. 
They're very quick to speak somebody else's prayer. Put your hands over here, don't put them over here. You know? Lift your, lift your pants like this. Sister, you're wearing hijab the wrong way. Very quick to correct people. But when it comes to themselves, they just recite the words and there's no connection with Allah. It's been a long time since they cried one tear for the sake of Allah. That is imbalance. That is when you emphasize knowledge and you don't emphasize spirituality. And then on the other side, there are people that are so spiritual that just say, forget the world, I just want to remember God. Forget what, forget what happens in the world. And that's not Islam either. Allah doesn't let us do that either. We have to find a balance between these two things. And when we do, we get amazing people. When you find a balance between these two things, you get remarkable human beings. Ulul al-bab. These are the people who can look at life and say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batilan, which are the next ayah. Master, you did not create this without purpose. There's a reason you made this. I see purpose in my own life now. You see a mission in your life. I used to be, my, my mission before I found Islam, my mission used to be, I want to finish school, I want to get a job, I want to make a lot of money, then I'm going to party. That was my mission. I didn't have a mission beyond that. There are people whose mission in life does not go beyond today. They live their life as though this is it. This is it. What do you want to do? I don't know, have some fun? What do you want to do in life? Nothing. Don't stress me out. I don't like to think about that stuff. Just leave me alone. Let me relax. When you find faith, you realize that the entire universe has purpose. Which means you have to have purpose too. Everything about you changes. Why am I studying? What am I studying? How is it going to help me? How is it going to help other people? Everything changes. Everything. You become people with a mission. رَبَّنَا لَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ حَقِّنَا عَذَابَ اللَّهِ This is the reality of the Qur'an. And that's the last piece I want to share with you before I take your questions. This, in my view, in my personal view, I am convinced of this more and more every day. The Qur'an is the only text, the only document, that at the same time is incredibly intellectual. If you ponder on it, if you study it deeply, it is incredibly intellectual. And at the same time, it is incredibly spiritual. It combines both of those dimensions at the same time. I'd like to share two ayat with you. One ayah, Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran." Another ayah, He also says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran." Why don't they think deeply about the Qur'an? Why don't they think deeply about the Qur'an? He said this twice. He said this twice. But one time he said, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُ فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Had it been from someone other than Allah, there would have been a lot of contradiction in it. Now I'll say that again. Why don't they reflect? Why don't they think about the Qur'an? Because if they thought about it, they would realize there are no contradictions. That's one statement. The other statement is, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا don't they, don't they reflect deeply on the Qur'an or are their hearts locked up? Are the hearts locked up? Now I'll repeat those two statements so everybody's clear about what I'm talking about. Allah says you should reflect on the Qur'an because if you do, you will find that there are no what? What did I say? There are no contradictions. That's number one. Number two, why don't you reflect? Are your hearts locked up? Now when you find contradictions in something, is that an intellectual exercise or a, a spiritual exercise? To look for consistency or to look for contradiction? Intellectual. Is that like intellectual or spiritual? Intellectual. That's intellectual. And on the other side he says, why don't you reflect on the Qur'an? Is there something wrong with your heart? When he says, is there something wrong with your heart, what's he complaining about? Spiritual. It's spiritual. So Allah is saying then that reflection on the Qur'an, deep thinking about the Qur'an, is going to address a spiritual problem and it will address an intellectual problem. So the world, the Muslims need reflection on the Qur'an. The Muslims need a tadabbur from Qur'an al -Karim. They need to think deeply about what this book is saying. It needs to be a profound like time spent pondering, what are you saying, Ya Allah? What are you saying? Those of you that are familiar with my talks, when I give a khutbah, usually how many ayat do I quote when I give a khutbah? Anybody know? One. You know why I do that? Because I believe that reflection on one ayah is better 
then quoting 20 ayat, 20 verses, 20 places in the Quran, and you didn't actually reflect on any of them, you quoted them quickly, 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 quickly. It's less benefit. You take a little bit, but you look, at least stare at it a little bit. You know, I, I mentioned this in New York when I was there a couple of weeks ago, when you go to a beautiful ocean, you just, you, you, you know, maybe you got a chance to go to California. It's just gorgeous ocean. And you're standing there looking at the ocean and say, oh, that's nice, and you go. <laughs> or do you stand there for a little bit and take it in? You see, people sit at the beach just watching the waves for an entire day and they don't move. Because it's beautiful. It requires time. You don't say, okay, now i got to go to New York and i got to see the street. I'll look at Times Square for a second and then I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't do that. Oh, that's nice, and you move on. If something is beautiful, it captures your attention for a while. You stay at it. This is what the Qur'an deserves. Now because you're university students, I want to share with you what I believe to be, inshallah, 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 the renaissance of the Ummah. How the Muslims are going to revive not only themselves, but they're also going to revive the entire world. I personally believe, this is, these are my own beliefs, you do not have to agree with them. I personally believe that unrestricted greed and celebrated greed has led the world in a very terrible direction. I believe that because of this greed, major, major corporations are, are allowed to run their way, have their way in the world that has created the kind of pollution problems and the kind of environmental disasters. We complain about the environmental disasters, which is just the fruit. The seed of that is greed. Those, those companies that are creating destruction all over the world, that are polluting natural waters, that are destroying entire farmlands and cutting down trees, the, the, you know, all of that is actually a result of human greed. And human greed is something that can only be addressed intellectually, spiritually. You can make all the policies in the world. You can have all the climate change scientists debate the issue all you want. If you don't address and curb, we can never stop greed. All human beings have it. But until we learn to curb it and balance it, this problem will only get worse. The world is now facing, it's standing at a precipice. SubhanAllah, all kinds of crazy things are happening in the world. Bees are disappearing. All kinds of fish are disappearing from the ocean. And people wonder why. And the answers are very clear. To me, the answer is very, very clear. Greed. That's why it's disappearing. There's no, really, there's no deeper answer to this. And I personally believe that the response, the thing that will move humanity away from unrestricted greed, and it will bring them back to being human again, being human, being decent again, is going to be a renaissance. And we Muslims have an opportunity to bring about a renaissance, and I'll tell you how. I personally believe, some of you, how many people are here in the engineering field? Engineering? I kind of thought so. Yeah, I am in the land of cars. So. <laughs> Medical field, bio, the biology field, very good, chemistry perhaps. So a lot of you are in the sciences. How about the human science, humanities, like political science, anthropology, sociology, psychology perhaps? How many psychos here? <laughs> very good. I'm very proud, by the way. If you guys are in the humanities, keep it up. And don't stop until you get a PhD. Keep going. Okay. Now. Engineering itself is blind. Science is blind. You can study science to produce the, you know, a solution for humanity. You can also study science to produce weapons that will kill humanity. You can study science and you can further the cause of a machine, of a corporation that runs on greed. And you can help them further their agenda. You can do that. You can also study science to help people that are starving or in desperate need or create, create some kind of sustainability in the world. You can do that too. The option is, the science itself is blind. It doesn't, it doesn't have a conscience. Science does not have a conscience. People have a conscience. People have a conscience. I personally believe if Muslims become people that reflect on the Qur'an, if they can deeply and in, in a meaningful way reflect on the Qur'an, then they will have the insights. They will have this, you know, drive to want to take the best of what they learned about this world and use it to make the world a better place. Allah Azza wa Jal, 
in the Quran, yeah? You can clap, it's okay. <laughs> I feel bad. I didn't say that. You clap for me. I just felt bad for that one person. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just helping them out. Okay. This is what I personally believe. I want to give you a couple of examples of this. I want to give you a couple of examples of this. So some Muslims feel like if you study evolution or if you study the origins of life, that it will destroy your faith, right? Because I, do you believe in evolution or do you believe in Adam? Oh my god, this is Allah. What are we going to do? I thought about evolution, I learned some things and now I don't know if I can believe in the Quran anymore. Let's read the Quran on the issue. And I so you turn to Surah Al-Kabood, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ بَدَأَ الْخَلْقِ Didn't they travel around all over the earth and didn't they take a good look at how creation began? God is telling us in the Qur'an, I will not only tell you how creation began, you must go in the earth and go figure out how creation began. You will not learn how creation began in a book of religion, you will have to go the earth and dig and excavate and explore and then you will find out how creation began. Can you believe that's in the Qur'an? Go find out how creation began. Go study it. We're not being told, hey, don't study that, it'll mess up your iman. Don't study the origins of life, it'll mess you up. Allah is saying, go, go study, go explore it. I read that and I said, whoa, ya Allah, you want me to leave the library, you want me to leave the masjid, and you want me to go explore the earth and figure out how creation began. Subhanallah. Kayfa bada al khal? Look up the ayah yourself, Surah Al Kabul. And many ulama did, many ulama traveled different, different kinds of planets to try to figure out how did creation begin because Allah must have given us answers on the earth. We are not afraid to explore the world. Muslims are not supposed to be afraid to explore the world. We're supposed to celebrate the exploration of the world. We're supposed to be a religion that celebrates the marvelous creation of God. We don't see a contradiction between science and religion. We don't see that as you are, either you're a person of science or you're a person of faith. We actually believe the more you become a person of science, the more it increases you in your faith. And the more you increase in your faith, the more it wants you to study science. That's what it is. You know? I don't know how he took a risk a second time, but this time <laughs> you guys helped him out. <laughs> and so along those notes, the last piece of this, I said that there are, the, 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 the passage I, I shared with you, it was about the spiritual, it was about the intellectual, wasn't it? There are people that I know, I have some of my, my friends, and people ask me sometimes, we, listen, we watch your videos, who do you watch? I say Tom and Jerry, but that's uh, <laughs> my inspiration. But, uh, but actually my inspirations are a few individuals that I consider mentors, they are terrible public speakers, but they're incredibly smart. And I know them personally, I have a lot of conversations with them. Like for instance, one of the, one of the people that I really look up to, a dear friend of mine, and I consider him an older brother, he, um, he used to study Qur'an with me when I first got interested in Qur'anic studies, but he went a different direction. He went and studied uh, the philosophy of science, and then he studied more Qur'anic studies, then he did a PhD in Islamic studies out of Yale University, and then he went to Boston, and now he's doing a PhD on the term ayah. Crazy. Yeah, these people are deep. These guys are deep. My other friend, who's from, who's from Duke University in the United States, just finished his thesis on the faith, the, the belief system, that the, the, the Tawheed belief system of Newton. That Newton actually wrote papers declaring that he was a strong believer in just one God who could not have a son or who could not be begotten. And actually he articulates how Newton in his private library had not only a copy of the Qur'an, but also commentaries on the Qur'an, and had had interactions with Muslims. And actually some of his, some of his writings are directly related to Surah Al-Ikhlas. Now this is an important study, and it's actually by Duke University itself, this paper is being considered pioneering and revolutionary. Not the, the Muslims aren't saying it, he hasn't even published it yet. His university peers are saying this is revolutionary stuff. This is pretty good stuff. Now I'm sharing this with you for a reason. 
Because in the, in, in the modern discourse, it is almost argued that people who become sophisticated in science, it would be stupid for them to believe in God. It would be dumb for them to have faith. And actually the great pioneers of science across the board in Europe and across the board in America, the original pioneers of science consistently were very strong believers in, in a creator. They were very strong believers in a God. There are actually papers written by scientists on the absurdity of atheism. I didn't write them. They did. Non-Muslim writers, scientists writing abs the absurdity of atheism. And not, not one, multiple papers. We don't know this stuff. What we know is what gets popular on YouTube. Right? And then we watch one or two of those things and our faith starts getting shaken. So as I conclude this talk, I said conclude like four times now, but this is real conclude. As I conclude this talk, I want to talk to you about the ayah itself. What does the ayah mean and how is it tied to the foundations of our faith? The word ayah. Number one, the Qur'an is obsessed with the term ayah. It is absolutely obsessed with the term ayah. It uses it virtually everywhere, all the time. So if you walk away from the Qur'an and say, what is the Qur'an about? You will say it's about the ayah. Now unfortunately, the ayah gets translated as what? Verse. verse. It gets translated as verse. But actually the ayah is something far more. The ayah is the ability to look at something and derive a conclusion. Something that leads you to something else is an ayah. Anything that leads you to something else. So for instance, if it says exit there, or it says restaurant that way, that's not a restaurant, that's just an ayah. If I go that way, what will I find? A restaurant. That's an ayah. You get it? Now, you know, the, I'll tell you a crazy story about an ayah. In Surah Saba, Surah Saba, Surah number 34, there's a story of Solomon, Sulaiman and the queen. <coughs> the, he calls the queen into his castle. He calls the queen into his castle. And his castle was pretty cool. It was an aquarium. His castle was an aquarium, except the floor was the aquarium. So it looks like you're about to walk into water, but it's clear glass. So she stepped on it and she realized that it wasn't water, it was actually glass. And the second she stepped on it, she became a believer. She stepped on it and she said, I believe in God. When you read that, you get confused. You're like, wait, wait, wait. If I stepped on glass and it wasn't water, I wouldn't start believing in God. Why in the world did she step on glass and accept Islam, accept the faith, accept the Creator? Oh, the history, you got to know what's going on. These people believed in the sun. These people believed in the sun because the sun gave the world heat. So the queen had a theology where she worshipped the sun. When she, st she, saw, the, she saw water, but she, did she see the glass? No. There is something behind this architecture. I, I think there's something, but there's something more to it. Immediately she realized, I look at the sun, but there's something more to it. And so she said, oh, I get it. There's a God. <laughs> to her, that glass floor was an ayah. Just that glass floor was an ayah. Now, if that's the case, the Quran is full of ayah. And these ayah, as I tried to tell you, what do the ayat of the Quran do? The ayat of the Qur'an say, for example, فَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرْ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ Look at the sky, turn your eyes, see if you can find a crack. أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ فَوْقَهُمْ Didn't they look at the birds? Right? They say, أَفَلَا يَنْظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبِلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Didn't they look at the camel? Go stare at the camel. The Qur'an says, here's a religious exercise for you. Go stare at a camel. If somebody's standing there staring at a camel in a zoo, he says, what are you doing? You say, Ibadah. <laughs> Honestly, you're applying an eye of the Quran complaint. Why don't you go stare at the camel? Go, go stare at the camel. Why the sama kaifanu fiya? Why the jibal kaifanu siba? Go climb a mountain. Go stand in a mountain, just looking at the Alps. What you doing? Oh, just you know, appreciating the ayat of Allah, engaging in ibadah. That's ibadah. What do we think, Muslims? What do we think? Worship. Worship is reading ayat of the Quran. Equally, worship is staring at a bird. Equally, worship is staring at the ocean. Equally, worship is appreciating the beauty of a cloud. The ayat of the Qur'an force you to see the world around you and find beauty in it. And when you find beauty in it, it reminds you of what, who pushed you to go there? 
the ayat of the Qur'an. So you come back to the ayat of the Qur'an. Then they push you out again. Then you come back again. Then they push you out again. And they come back again. And ayat are not just about looking at the sky and the bird and the tree. The Qur'an says look at history. The Qur'an says look inside yourselves, study psychology. Look at your feelings. The love between a husband and a wife is an ayah, so you should explore it. You know? Your history, you should explore it. Your, your fingertips, you should explore them, you should understand physiology. He tells us that. Actually, all human experience is an ayah. The ayah is a unifying theory of knowledge. The ayah suggests, if we understand the ayah in the Qur'an, then what we are saying is, every human experience can be spiritual in nature. Every intellectual experience and every, spirit, every, every inquiry of the human being can turn into an ayah. Wallahi can turn into an ayah. No, nothing will not be an ayah. I was driving on the highway one time when I first understood this concept, I said I have to test this theory. I don't know if everything can be an ayah. How can everything be an ayah? So I was driving, I remember in California, and I was being driven by a bunch of college students. And you know, we have speed limits. <laughs> we have speed limits. But this brother was driving like it's the Autobahn. And he's just, zhu, 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 zhu. and I'm like, let's slow down, bro. And then I immediately remember, that's an ayah. <laughs> Human beings love to rush. <laughs> that is an entire PhD thesis, the human urgence, the human sense of urgency. Is there an urgency to be, for your turn to come at the post office? For your turn to come in the restaurant? For the waiter to come and take your order? For the light to turn green? For the airplane to start boarding? Is there a sense, when are we going to land? When are we going to land? When are we going to land? When is the movie going to begin? When is this lecture going to be over? <laughs> you love to rush. Even the car speeding became an ayah. We passed by a billboard. You know, an American billboard, they have these big billboards. They have this big billboard of a family that's, you know, mother, father, children, they're hugging each other and there's a home behind them. And they say, buy the American dream. You know, it's, nowadays it's the American nightmare, but still, <laughs> buy the American dream. You know, they want you to buy a house, subprime mortgage and all of that, right? But you know, I look at that and I say, how can that be an ayah? That's just a mortgage company selling a house. But then I realize, the human want to having a house. Why do you think Allah gives us Jannah? What do you get in, what do you get in heaven? What does Allah promise in heaven? A house, with a swimming pool, with a nice garden. The things you want in this world. He says, I'll give you better. You want a house, don't you? And then Allah says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ فِي أَهْلِهِ مَسْرُورًا And he worked for the wrong house, so he used to be happy in this life, but not in the next. Even that became an ayah. One of my favorite ayat on that trip, I look for ayat everywhere, but my, one of my favorite ayat on that trip was we, because it's California, we passed by some cows. And the cows get really close to the highway which is they're in danger of becoming beef a little too soon. <laughs> now, other animals, when they are close to danger, what do they do? What does a bird do? It flies away. A snake turns around. A squirrel tries to see if he can beat the car. A deer, Allah did not give too much of a brain to a deer, he says, let me try to hit it. <laughs> so that's a deer. But usually, at least there is some reaction, isn't there? Animals have some kind of reaction. But a cow, a cow, if you, you just go right by a cow, what happens to a cow? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> the fur on its skin goes, and it doesn't move. Like it doesn't move. It does not move. And I thought that was an eye. How is that an eye? Cow not reacting. An ayah. Because Allah describes in the Qur'an, people that keep their minds numb, people that keep themselves busy with music and movies and video games and drugs and alcohol and you name it. One thing after our clubs and parties. And they keep themselves busy. They become so numb that they don't realize the world around them. Allah says, أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ They are like cattle. They don't even realize the dangers around them. They don't even realize what's happening. But they're even more lost. So I look at a cow and I remember what happens to human beings when they're lost. When, they, when they're numbed out. 
All human experience can turn into an ayah. Your mother-in-law can turn into an ayah. <laughs> Your husband. He was like, I know which I have in our own. No, no, no. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, the idea here is that our faith is rooted in looking at the world in a unified way. Looking for positives everywhere. Looking for a way to appreciate the good in things. Because the purpose of an ayah, now this is the end part, again the end part. You know, the purpose of the ayah is to bring you close to Allah. The purpose of an ayah is to give you some more direction so you can get closer to God. Closer to your final destination. That's what the purpose of an ayah is. You know what happened to me when I was in Switzerland? A drunk guy got on the tram when I was in Switzerland. Some of you were there, I told this story. Right? And this guy starts speaking in, I think it was German. I don't speak English. But they, the, fellows that, the fellows that were there with me, they translated for me, yeah, where are you people from? So I turned around and said, I'm from Texas. <laughs> and he said, Texas? And he said something, 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 and everybody started laughing. And I said, what did, what did, he, what did he say? <laughs> and he said, where's your cowboy hat? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, I'm so... And then he asked me later, he said, please don't do a terrorist attack in my country. <laughs> That's what he said to me. And I turned around and said, not all Texans are terrorists. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't think you understood that. <laughs> but you know what? Even that was an ayah. Even that was an ayah. I took a lesson from that about how just normal people in that society must be given so many negative messages about Muslims that when they see any person anywhere, they assume the worst of what they have seen must be this person. Right? And when you're drunk, you don't hold back. You know, the Swiss are usually a reserved people. They don't look at you dirty, but they won't say anything. But he was drunk, so no brakes on. So he just said it. He just came out and said it, you know. And I appreciate that he said it, because, you know, I don't blame him, and I'm not angry at him. But I do feel that, man, we have a lot of work to do, because people have created an image of Muslims that just the average person who doesn't even hate Islam, but they're actually afraid of Islam. I feel bad for them, that they've, that we've, they've taken something so beautiful, and they've made it into something so ugly, and the reason they were able to do that successfully is because Muslims gave them plenty of reasons to think that way. The Qur'an is perfect. Our religion is beautiful. Muslim behavior, not so much. We have given them plenty of examples to be afraid of Islam. We have given them plenty of examples to think that we are not civilized. And so when they manipulate that and create fear-mongering among them, then before we get angry at them, we have to clean up our own house. We have to clean up. They will exaggerate. They will never stop exaggerating. That will never, the people who hate Islam will hate it even more. We can't change that. And I'm not interested in changing that. What I am interested in changing is us ourselves. We have to show with our actions that those are lies, not with our words. We can issue all the press releases we want until we become a people who take ayat and really turn the world around. Nothing changes. Nothing at all changes. That is the world, that's the world you have to explore. Some of you want to study Islam. I argue, finish your studies, engage your studies, study Islam alongside the, the, the sciences and the fields that you're specializing in because we need people who can take these sciences. I want political scientists, I want engineers, I want you know, uh, uh, researchers in, in, in biology, in neurology, in all these fields. I need the people, the Muslims to be the highest caliber people in these sciences so that when they reach those sciences, they can show the world that even all of that are ayat. They can show them the world, this is all ayat. But if they don't study this stuff, they won't be able to show the world that these are ayat. If you're only studying these things so you can get a job and make some money, then this is tragic. Then you took something so great, knowledge that Allah is giving you, ayat that Allah is teaching you, and you didn't show the world what it's actually for. SubhanAllah. This year I have two students, one of them is a PhD in geology, his wife is a PhD in neuroscience. And they're both, they both memorized the Qur'an. And they're stu they studied Arabic and now they're studying Islamic studies with one of my colleagues, Sheikh Abdul Nasir. And every day when they study a hadith, when they study an ayah, when they study something, they take different notes from everybody else. And I see them like, what, what are you writing down? Well, they write because they've studied something in science. That I have no idea, but they see things I don't see. They see things I cannot see. 
I have focused myself on trying to explain the Qur'an. But as I explain it to you, you will take what I explain and further it so much more because of the sciences that you're going to excel in. You're going to show that Allah's ayat are even talking about what you're studying. This will be the renaissance of Islam in the world. This will be when the world starts seeing things differently. This will be when greed is curved. When the highest intellectuals of the world see things in the light of the beauty of faith. You know? I pray that Allah Azza makes you the generation that really lifts the ummah out of the rut that it's in and brings this knowledge, this beautiful knowledge to light and really lets the ayat of Allah shine so people can again see the world around them as a means of getting closer to their Creator. Thank you so, so very much for listening to me carefully tonight. I'm going to open it up for questions and answers. A special round of applause for the moms that have been standing to keep their babies calm. So you can listen. Thank you so much. May Allah reward you and may Allah raise your children to be leaders of the Muslims. Amen.